Hello family. Um, as you can probably tell, we're shooting this video from the sanctuary at House of Faith. Uh, as I started seeing uh, this past week some of the areas of our state coming back open, I got very excited and I talked to Pastor and said, can I shoot from the pulpit tonight? So that's what we're doing. And without the, all the, the sound team and the musical team here, I got to tell you, we're learning how much we should appreciate them because we had to figure out the lighting and everything on our own. So anyway, from House of Faith tonight, I'm hoping this uh, finds everybody healthy and safe and just continuing to uh, hang in there as we, as we wind down this uh, shut-in, shelter-in-place from the COVID-19. Tonight's message, preparing to return. Uh, now, there's some light at the end of the tunnel. Um, uh, about a month and a half ago, we were placed on what uh, I told you was a timeout. The Lord had told me, I'm placing you on timeout. That was a month and a half ago. Now, there's some light at the end of the tunnel. Return is visible on the horizon. But what should that return look like, family? I'm pretty sure what it's not supposed to look like, it's not supposed to be business as usual. I believe our return should be anything but normal. I believe we were placed on timeout uh, for a reason. Um, uh, a, a month and a half ago, he told us that I want you to, to examine yourself, check your prayer life, check your praise, check your worship, uh, check your walk. Um, if anything needs to change, I'm giving you time to work on that right here and right now. And before I get into that any more deeply, there there's a story that I'd like to share with you that was shared with me recently. This is how the story goes. There was a young man in his early 20s walking the streets of an average small town in America. It was Sunday morning and he was coming off a night of drinking. He was making his way home to his empty apartment when he passed by the front of a church. And as he did, something spoke to the young man. Something told him to go inside and much to his own surprise, he did. Uh, he went through the front door, encountering no one. He continued through the rear of the sanctuary, though he wasn't aware that that's where he was. Uh, he heard someone speaking off to his right, so he, he stepped through a gap in a very large curtain, and before he knew what was happening, he was walking down the center aisle of the sanctuary, heading directly toward the pulpit. Now, please understand, this young man was unchurched. He was tattooed over much of his body. He had various piercings in his face. He was disheveled, poorly dressed, dirty, unshaved, unshowered, and he was reeking of the night before, and there he was heading down the center aisle of the church. And as he walked slowly down the aisle, he glanced side to side, left to right, looking for a seat, but there was none. He was late. Service had started. Even the greeters and the ushers were seated. The first hymn had been sung. The announcements had been made. The plate had been passed, and the pastor was about to deliver the message. And, and down the aisle towards him comes this young, tattooed man. Um, and the congregation on the right and on the left were staring at him. It was getting uncomfortable and awkward now. Uh, what does he think he's doing? Where does he think he's going? Uh, we're not sure what's going to happen because he's completely out of order. What's going to happen because he's completely out of line. You can't just go to the front of the church, can you? He's almost at the altar now, and somebody better do something. Pastor was trying to ignore what was happening, but it was confusing him as well. Pastor started to stumble in the delivery of the word. And at the last moment, an elder of the church, an 80-something-year-old man wearing a three-piece suit with the cufflinks and the stick pins and the pocket watch with the chain hanging just so, he stood up with the help of a cane, and he started to follow the tattered, tattooed, pierced young man up the aisle. And everyone seated in the sanctuary breathed a sigh of relief. Elder was going to correct the problem. This guy's all out of order, but Elder's going to restore order. Everything's going to be all right now because Elder's going to let him know. But Elder didn't get to the young man in time. He moved slowly due to his advanced years. And you could have heard a pin drop when the young man sat down right on the steps leading to the pulpit. Can you imagine right there at the altar? Now, I know you guys at House of Faith can picture that quite plainly. But then the unthinkable happened. As if everything was happening up to this point wasn't enough, Elder reached the young man who was now seated on the steps, rather, and rather than correct him or scold him or discipline him, the, um, the elder instead laid down his walking cane and plopped down on the steps right next to the young man in his three-piece suit. And he put his arm around him and he looked up and said, Go ahead and preach, Pastor. Don't hold back on our account. 
Why did that happen, church? Because, family, the elder recognized something in that young man that reminded him of himself many, many, many years before. Now, Pastor had at this point completely lost his trend of thought. He had completely lost his place in his notes. And after a brief pause, he looked over his congregation and said, What I was going to preach here today you would have never remembered, but what you saw here today you'll never forget. Family, as we prepare to return, let me remind you all that we must be careful how we treat people. We must be careful how we handle people. We must be careful that no one gets marginalized. We've got to be careful what kind of message we're sending out. Um, every church in America has got to be the church that says it doesn't matter where you come from or how you got here or what's on your breath. Every church in America ought to be the church that says there's a seat for you right here, right next to me, and if there's nowhere else for you to sit but on the steps, I'm going to sit there with you. Can I get an amen, family? Amen. See, we got some people in the audience. <laughs> so as we prepare to return, family, there are some things we must do in preparation. And the first thing I believe we must do is we must acknowledge our own transgressions. Time out, a time of self-examination. Um, there's no getting help until you admit you have a problem, a shortcoming, a sin. And it takes a great deal of humility. It takes a great deal of contrition to do that. It's not easy, but it is necessary. Uh, King David. Uh, spoke of this in great detail. David had just been called on the carpet by God through the prophet Nathan for his adulterous affair with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband Uriah the Hittite. And when he spoke of these words in 2 Samuel 12, 13, they went like this. I have sinned against the Lord, David said. David had sinned with Bathsheba, against Uriah, and against God. This was King David, mind you. This is the man described as a man after God's own heart. But the moment comes when you've got to own your own stuff. I said you've got to get to a place where you stop blaming everybody else for your problems and your bad decisions and own your own stuff. And David gets to that place in Psalm 51.3 when he says this, For I know my transgressions, my sin is ever before me. And he goes on in Psalm 51, 7. He says, cleanse me, purge me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Now, this reference family to hyssop goes all the way back to Leviticus 14, 4, where direction is being given regarding the purification and the cleansing of lepers. That's what they were talking about there. See, leprosy was an unclean thing, a disease, something terribly foul that could be easily seen on the outside, on the exterior, on the surface. Uh, please know, David was described as a good-looking guy. He was a handsome man, ladies. He was easy on the eyes. He was not hard to look at, if you catch my drift. And, and so why then was David saying, Lord, purge me with hyssop? He had no leprosy on the outside, no visible external flaws. Well, I'll tell you why. Because David realized that God doesn't look at the outside like man does. When man sees the external leprosy, he turns away his head as not to look or gaze upon it. Can you imagine, family, if God were to take all the ugly internal leprosy he sees on our inside and made it visible to us, just how ugly would we appear? And David asked God to clean me from the inside out. Psalm 51.10 says this, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. See, this is going to take an inside job, family. Prepare us, Father, to return. And when you do, Lord, you when you restore me, and this is what David said in Psalm 51.13, When you do, when you restore me, Lord, then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will turn back to you. Can I get an amen, family? Amen. What does that mean? It means you're going to be a witness for God and a powerful, with a powerful, powerful testimony. See, family, when God brings you out, when God changes your life, he doesn't just do it for you. He does it so you can tell others like you about your journey. Psalm 51, 13 says, I'm going to teach others about my transgression. See, I can't teach you what I do not know. I can't teach you what I have not experienced. I can't direct somebody through something that I have not been through myself, but I can teach you about my transgressions. See, I wasn't always Pastor Skip. I lived some life. I got some experience that might live up, uh, might line up with some of the stuff that you guys are going through right now. See, I didn't enter this world 59 years ago singing, He Knows my name. Oh no, I made some bad choices and I went down some wrong paths. But God has taken this broken vessel and through it, he relays to you that the same God that fixed me can fix you if you'll let him. Church, so many people come to me and they ask me this question. What does God have for me to do? What is my call? 
And I really honestly believe it is this simple. God wants to use you in the lives of people who are like you used to be. I'm going to say that again. God wants to use you in the lives of people who are like you used to be. He didn't deliver you so you could go live happily ever after. He delivers us to become a testimony. Um, Revelation 12, 11 tells us how we're going to overcome. This is what he said, by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimonies, that's how we're going to do it. Check this out. I want to give you an example. What if in every church in America... Um, the spiritual church mother, you know who she is. Um, she's the well-known, well-respected prayer warrior, the elder. She's at all the functions. When she walks in the church, there's a buzz. Ooh, church mother's here. You know, it's almost like you can feel the Holy Spirit on her when she walks by. You know, what if church mother in every church in America got up and went to one of the young girls that's hurting in the congregation and put her arm around her and loved on her and got real with her and said, baby, I ain't always been spiritual mother. Um, Back in the day, I was, I was a hot mess. I, I, I ran hard and fast, and I, I had some men, baby. I had some men, but, but I got good news for you. The same God that restored me can restore you. Can we, get an on, can we get that honest church? Can we be prepared to return, family? What if the senior and older and experienced men of every church in America would take one of these young men under their, under their wing and, and tell them the truth? I've been there. I've been a player. I've been in and out of jail. I've been where you are. I know what it is to be involved in things that are illegal in order to fit in. What if? Can you imagine church? Can you imagine family how powerful that would be? We've got no time to be looking down our noses and down our glasses at this point in time. We need to prepare to return. I'm going to go back to Psalm 51 10 where, where David says create in me a clean heart O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. This is going to require an inside job Holy Spirit so we're going to ask you to come. Come now now and prepare to make us ready to return. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Go in peace, family. See you soon.